eight new titles. Eight different authors. A couple of good lookers, but only one book club. And that's the Richard and Judy Book Club, exclusive to WH Smith. Being in the Richard and Judy Book Club is a fantastic thing, I think, for a book. And I think it's flattering to be in this company. Being in the book club is going to help people find my book more easily amongst all the other wonderful books that are being published all the time. When you consider the literally hundreds and hundreds of books that they go through, it's really kind of beating the odds. It's winning the lottery to get chosen by Richard and Judy. It feels amazing and I'm so excited about seeing my books in WH Smith's all around the country. My first ever novel to start of a 10 was in the first ever Richard and Judy book club. So I feel like a kind of grizzled veteran now, but I'm equally delighted. It's something that is in institution in the UK. It's something, you know. So I Google it. I shouldn't have done that because now I'm freaked out. I walk past Smith's with my children and I've seen those big displays for years and years and I'm just going to annoy the what's it out of them because I'll be dragging them past and say, look, it's me. So yeah, it's just tremendously exciting. Right, let's not hang around. I cannot wait to get going with this season's books. And first on the pile is Us by David Nichols. Judy, why don't you explain why we had to include this in the summer collection? Well, I mean, it's yet another wonderful book from David Nichols. Um, it's the story of a married couple who's... Uh, one of them, the husband, thinks their marriage is going just great. He adores his wife and all the rest of it. Um, and the wife thinks opposite. And one night, they go to bed... And she says to him, do you know what? I think it's about time we called it a day. And he is completely and utterly gobsmacked and horrified. And the story is about how he tries to save this marriage. And he tries to save it by this anally organised grand European tour with their son, who reminds me very much of Lupin in the Pooter Diaries, you know. Um, this, this incredibly difficult son. And there's a kind of slightly unpleasant alliance between this teenage son and the mother against the father, isn't there? They sort of mock him at every turn. Well, he's kind of like, I mean, because he tells it from, the, the story's told from his point of view. And he is terribly modest and he sees that himself as being incredibly ordinary, uh, boring, as you say, slightly anal, slightly obsessive. What does he say? He says he kind of, you know, he, whenever he sees a kitchen countertop, he feels he's got to wipe it down <laughs> wipe with it bleach. Down, yes. <laughs> um, whenever he sees a woman with a, a décolletage, um, in her, he always feels the urge to refasten the top button of her blouse right, yeah. and stuff like that. So he tells it in a very kind of self-deprecating way, and you fall in love with him for oh, that. Oh, he's fantastic. Um, he, he knows that he's a, a, a touch uh, compulsive obsessive. He knows that, and he tries to deal with it. Actually, the, 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 the wife... I found, although, it, I, I don't take this the wrong way, I found her really irritating. <laughs> I wanted to slap Connie. her. Connie, because she's so... I mean, she's, she's, she's a, a kind of um, frustrated artist in a way, isn't she? Yeah. You know? I mean, she's, she's never actually quite fulfilled the potential that she thinks that she has. Um, and she's so rude to him and sniffy with him. And I, 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 mm, well. But he... And they, they embark on this grand European tour, his instigation to save their marriage, because he thinks he's doing a great thing for her, because she's really interested in art. Yes. So they'll go around Europe and they'll see all these wonderful uh, exhibitions and art galleries and all the rest of it, and he's doing it all for her. And it's heartbreaking, really. Well, in a sense, it's the old story, he's trying too hard, and that's <laughs> But it's a great book. Undoing. It's a great book. It's very amusing. It's very funny. It's, it's really very funny. Few, yeah, very, very funny, and also very... Uh, but, you know, it tugs on the old heartstrings. Well, listen, we weren't able to meet face-to-face -face with David, whose screenwriting work is uh, very demanding of his time at the moment, but we did have the chance to put a few questions to him. Come on, then, David. Whose side are you secretly on, Douglas's or Connie's? Well, um, because I'm the novelist, I have to stay objective, I suppose. I mean, you have to see... You have to understand that people do things for their reasons, and Connie is very unhappy and a little bit bored and taken for granted and, you know, has a perfectly good reason for thinking that the marriage is over. And I really love Connie because she's, you know, she's so lively and outspoken and open-minded. Um, but the novels, you know, novels are different depending on who's telling the story and that, that this is a first-person novel in Douglas's voice. So inevitably he gets to state his case more clearly and you get to see more of him and understand him a little more. So I suppose Douglas has the upper hand. But at the same time, you know, the novel is about Douglas realising his faults. Uh, realising where he's gone wrong and also realising the strength of Connie's feelings. So I'm drawn towards Douglas, but I, I love Connie too. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> 
Connie is a great character, but she can be one heck of a pain, can't she? Um, no, I, I love her. I mean, she's very glamorous and she's very funny and she's, she's sort of smarter than Douglas, a bit shrewder, a bit more kind of aware of what's going on. And sometimes she's... You know, the last novel I wrote one day I had this character in called Emma Morney. He was so... Um, righteous you know she was so uh, moral and you know she could be a bit self-righteous at times but she was always sort of the voice of reason and the voice of decency and I thought I don't want to write another you know sort of female paragon of virtue I want to write someone who's a bit messier and a bit more irresponsible and who's sometimes a bit cruel and a bit thoughtless and and that's Connie really having said that you know she really loves Douglas and and loves her family and is just fine trying to find a way to deal with her frustration and unhappiness. So she can be uh, a little bit unsympathetic at times, but I think that's a, that's a quality of fully, a fully rounded character. So um, I, I love her. And as for their son, confession time, who is Albie based on? Not my son. <laughs> my son is very young and great fun. And uh, he isn't a long way from being a teenager. Uh, so I'm in this sort of golden haze at the moment. But but I was a teenager myself. I wasn't nearly as outrageous as Albie. I wasn't nearly as sort of sulky and moody and pretentious. But, you know, I had my moments. And I think it's a natural part of... Um, it's a natural tendency we have to want to create our own image separate from our parents and reject what our parents stand for. And when you're a teenager that can feel like that can feel rather heroic and brave and bold and then when you're a parent yourself you realize that actually it's a bit irritating and a bit rude and a bit a bit um, callous and cold and and so I thought it would be interesting to tell a story of someone growing into uh, an adolescent establishing establishing themselves but tell it from their parents point of view it would be great to know how things work out with the lovely Freya Christensen assuming that that is uh, not the plot of your next one. Can you just, just give us a thumbnail portrait of how she and Douglas get on eventually? You know, just to wrap things up, as it were. Go on, you know you want to. I can't do that. <laughs> um, partly because I don't know. I mean, it sounds pretentious because, you know, they're fictional characters and I created them and they can do whatever I tell them to. But I think I like the... I don't want to say too much about the ending, but I, I wrote a final chapter. All I will say is I wrote another chapter that was much more explicit, much sort of rounded things off and, and, and sort of put a full stop in it all. And it didn't feel right, really. I, I liked the kind of... I liked the slow fade of the novel. But again, I can't... How can I answer this without giving too much away? I can't. So I'm not going to. Now, obviously, you're no stranger to script writing because film-wise, you've not only penned uh, movie scripts of your own novels, Start of a Ten, which, of course, was in the Richard and Judy Book Club, and One Day, but you've also tackled Shakespeare and Thomas Hardy. So which do you think now is the most enjoyable, working with your own original script or adapting the work of other literary giants? Um, I think adapting my own work is a special kind of misery. <laughs> I have to say, I've done it twice now, and I really like the films that came out of it. But you, but you, you sort of you you make the film when you write the book. You know, you have it in your head, and you know what everyone looks like and what they say and do, and and then you do it again in script form, and suddenly everyone else has an opinion, and you have to listen to them because they know what they're doing too. So it's a very frustrating experience. And the great thing about adapting Thomas Hardy and Charles Dickens is they're not around to to argue, so I can do what I want while at the same time, you know, being faithful to the source material, loyal to the source material. Um, so I, I, I prefer adapting other people's work, and I, I think I'd think long and hard before I adapted one of my own books again. Um, it's very hard. Sometimes you need a kind of objective, critical eye, and if you've spent two or three years writing something, then uh, it's very hard to be as cruel and callous as you need to be when you adapt a novel. Don't forget you can download each and every book via Kobo for your e-reader or your smartphone via the Kobo app. Last summer, a short time before my son was due to leave home for college, my wife woke me in the middle of the night. At first I thought she was shaking me because of burglars. Since moving to the country, my wife had developed a tendency to jerk awake at every creak and groan and rustle. I tried to reassure her. It's the radiators, I'd say. It's the joists contracting or expanding. It's foxes. Yes, 
Fox is taking the laptop, she'd say. Fox is taking the keys to the car, and we'd lie and listen some more. There was always the panic button by the side of our bed, but I could never imagine pressing it in case the alarm disturbed someone, say, a burglar, for instance. I am not a particularly courageous man, not physically imposing, but on this particular night I noted the time, a little after four, sighed, yawned and went downstairs. I stepped over our useless dog, padded from room to room, checked windows and doors, then climbed the stairs once more. Everything's fine, I said, probably just air in the water pipes. What are you talking about, said Connie, sitting up now. It's fine, no sign of burglars. I didn't say anything about burglars. I said I think our marriage has run its course. Douglas, I think I want to leave you. I sat for a moment on the edge of our bed. Well, at least it's not burglars, I said, though neither of us smiled, and we did not get back to sleep that night. A good summary to me is something that is light-hearted and makes me feel all yummy inside when I've read it. And then I think... Um, also, when I think I must read, if I've read a certain author, I want to read the, another book that she's written. The, you know, it just leaves you, you know, feeling good. The book I was reading before Gone Girl was Beach Huts by Veronica Henry. And that's just a great book. Um, you can pick it up, put it down, and it's all the stories from all the different beach huts. And they all get their answers at the end. Um, and it just gives you a warm glow and... It's just a, a lovely, lovely read and um, yeah, it's not very taxing or anything like that but sometimes you don't want that. Sometimes you just want to pick up a book and be on a beach and, and just follow all these different people's stories. For me, my favourite summer read is the kind of book you can take on holiday with you and you know you're going to be in safe hands. There's nothing worse than wasting a holiday on something that's either over-challenging or at the same time, under-challenging. From the Richard and Judy list, my favourite holiday book was certainly, and still remains, Gone Girl. And I think the reason for that is that it's a book you just can't put down. And the frustrations of having a book like that when you're working every day is that you have to keep stopping. I'm delighted. It's actually my second time, so I feel doubly honoured. I was My first ever novel, to start of a 10, was, was in the first ever Richard and Judy book club back in 2003, I think, and it was a massive break for me then, and for a first-time novelist, a really terrific push. So I feel like a kind of grizzled veteran now, but I'm, but I'm equally delighted. You know, writing is such a solitary thing. You really don't know if, if you're achieving what you hope to achieve, you know, if the thing is making sense, if people are going to respond to it in the way you hope they will. And inevitably, the first few reads, the first few responses bring up things that never crossed your mind. And uh, I, I pay a lot of attention to rewriting. I'm happy to change things depending on feedback. But that moment when it's published and it's too late to change anything is always a little nerve-wracking. I have a little office I go to every day and um, uh, I have to turn off the internet. That's the biggest challenge. The amount of work I do is directly proportional to the amount of time I spend off the internet. So that's my first thing when I get through the door. But I drink a lot of coffee and I try and write from nine till one. And then in the afternoon, it's the, it's the admin. You've just got to read and read and read, and not just read and read, but watch and watch and watch, and take in as many stories as you can, you know, from, from high literature to, to popular culture, you know, just keep absorbing the stuff. And I suppose more practically, I think it's a mistake to edit on screen. I think you get sort of slightly hypnotised by words on the screen. I think it's better to print things out and either rewrite by hand, or, or either retype into the computer or, or edit with a pencil on the page, because... Words on the screen look so professional and neat and lovely. You sort of sit there and think, well, this this is great. Um, whereas actually, if you're reading it on paper as a reader, you pay slightly more attention, I think. Well, I'm really looking forward to our next title and to meeting the man whose clever and creepy story is taking the literary world by storm. Books should be like life. There's a lot of things in it. A lot of joy, a lot of tears, a lot of everything. And he's not even 30 years old. Come back to meet Joel Dicker. Don't forget, if you buy these books from your local branch of WH Smith, you'll get a special edition with access to added bonus content.